It would be disingenuous of me to imply I've never used this text before I have, perhaps not exactly as I'm coming tonight, but I feel direction excerpting one verse of Scripture from the Word of the Lord in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23. The wise man simply says, Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We preachers, we title our sermons. I like click. I'll remember that. But we do it to give you a handle to hang on. That way, next Tuesday morning when you wake up and hopefully you can say, Boy, Brother Mullings really did good the other night. I don't remember what he said. I just remember it was good. Uh, if you can remember the title, sometime you can weave your way back into the, the gist of the thought. I want to talk to you, if the Lord be my helper, for a little while tonight about decisions I didn't know I was making. Everybody say, praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. The wise man said, keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. One of the most profound principles of, of life in general and especially Christian life is revealed in this verse of Scripture. In the text, the word that's translated issues comes from a Hebrew word which literally means to cause or to bring something about. So it would not be taking liberties with the word of the Lord if we read it quite like this, keep your heart with all diligence because out of it are the becauses of life. You know... I've raised three children. We have five grandchildren, one great-grandchild. I'm getting old. But some of the most frustrating experiences in my life have been when my children misbehaved or did something that they shouldn't have done. And you confront them and say, why in the world did you do that? And they look at you and they say, because. And the bottom line is they were telling you the abject truth. It was out of their heart. It was one of those becauses of life. Now, I realize that in life, some things just are. and We need to accept that. Time and chance happens to all. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And let me interject this here. I want to pay special thanks to Brother Ryan Culp. He's been my, whatever you call him, my jockey, whatever this week. Such a kind and gracious young man. Thank you, Brother Ryan. That, yeah, that's good. But some things just are. Time and chance happen to all. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Now, I know that, that there are things that occur in the spirit world, and, and uh, I have pastored people that uh, everything that happened had some spiritual connotation to it. There was some underlying spiritual conflict or warfare or something, and, and it finally got to the point where some of them, quite frankly, were so spiritual they were spooky. And... Uh, but so let me help you a little bit with that. If you, by chance, happen to go out of this building tonight, go to your car, and the left front tire is flat, before you expend volumes of spiritual energy trying to determine what that means, I will help you. It probably means you got a nail in it. But the fact of the matter is that much of life, many of the things that we deal with in life, are the result of things that come out of our heart. They are the becauses of life. They are the result of decisions that have created a chain of events that days, months, sometimes even years later produce outcomes that we did not realize, could not foresee, and we did not understand at that moment in time when we made that seemingly inconsequential decision, or maybe it was consequential, but at that point in time, we were making countless other decisions that we did not know we were making. Part of the problem is that, that, that this generation does not have enough understanding about the consequences of decisions. In a general sense, and this is not a blanket indictment, but we are a generation that lives far too much in the moment. We are a feel-good generation. We are a generation that wants. We want. We want everything. We want it quick. We want it easy. And somehow we want to figure out a way that somebody else is going to pay for it. And often we have too little regard for the thoughts of the Lord and the results 
of ignoring divine principles. Micah talked about his generation, and he said his generation did not know the thoughts of the Lord, neither did they understand his counsel. That's why the wise man said that we need to get, get wisdom. Uh, that's, a, that's a major thing. But, but he said with all of your getting, get understanding. We need to realize that it is, we have reached a point in this destiny of the church that is not simply enough for us to give mental assent to the laws of God. It's not enough to be able to quote and recite reams of Scripture. That's not unimportant. We need to study to show ourselves approved. But the key in this hour, Brother Mooney already mentioned it, 119, 11 of Psalms. David said, Thy word, O God, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word that's translated hid in that verse of Scripture is a Hebrew word which means in the, in the noun tense is to, is to be an overseer or a caretaker. And so what David is saying, God, I have reached the point in life when I come to those decisive moments. I don't make it with human reasoning. I don't make it out of human values. But I have made your word the overseer and the caretaker of my heart. I've given an authority over my thoughts. I've given an authority over my decisions. Our generation has a tendency to overestimate ourselves. We overestimate our spirituality. We overestimate our wisdom. And there is an incredible danger in that because the problem is every way of a man is right in his own eyes. You need to understand, I don't care who you are, how long you've had the Holy Ghost, how high your office is, everybody needs a spiritual authority in their life. You need a higher authority that you answer to. That's why Proverbs said, be not wise in thine own eyes. Every one of us needs a pastor. We need a preacher in our life. It please God, may not please you, but it pleased God to choose a silly little art we call preaching to save them that believe. And that's in the progressive tense of the word. There is no single sermon. There's no single message. There's no single service that's going to determine your destiny. God has required us to have a steady diet of truth in our lives. You need to understand, preaching is more than just somebody getting up here and giving a, a, an impassioned appeal. There's something that happens when the Holy Ghost anoints the frailty of a preacher's flesh. Sometimes, in the, Paul said in the Spirit, we speak mysteries. When God anoints a preacher... There are sometimes revelatory things that take place. There's been many times in my ministry that I've had people come to me and say, Oh, Brother Mullings, when, tonight when, when I, I've been wrestling with something for years and, and I've been searching, and boy, when you said this and this and this tonight, a light turned on and, and it clicked and, 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 and it just opened up. And I've looked at them and I've said, Well, I'm, I'm happy for you, but I didn't say that. Oh, yeah, you did. I said, I couldn't have said that. I don't know that. And I go in and get the recording, and I listen to it. And I did say it because there's, it's, Paul said, in the Spirit, sometimes we speak mysteries. There's something that happens when God's anointing touches the frailty of human flesh, and we begin to minister eternal truths. In fact, Isaiah said, woe to those that are wise in their own eyes. We need a preacher in our life. If you make it to heaven, anybody that walks through the gate and stands on a street of gold is going to have the fingerprints of some preacher all over their soul. But because of an inflated sense of self, we often too flippantly make decisions that are more far-reaching than we realize. Sometimes through a lack of prayer or through a laziness after God, we arrive at decisive moments with a carnal mind and we make decisions after the flesh and not after the spirit. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, I fear lest by any means your minds might be corrupted. The phrase is translated any means. It comes from a, 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 a Greek phrase which means something hazy or indistinct. You know, we have an adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And all of us understand that, I think. And we, we try to guard ourselves against those, those things that would devour us. And we're very careful about our morals. And we're, we're careful about this. And we're, we, we would never succumb to, to alcoholism or drug addiction. But can I submit to you that the devil is just as happy to devour you with a broken trust or, or, or an offended spirit or bitterness as he is with... Some years ago, I, when I was superintendent, I was working with a young man that was having some real problems. And so he asked, he said, 
Bishop, I need help. I need you. So we sat down and we, we just began to talk. And, 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 and not long into our, our discourse, I said, well, I tell you right now, I know what part of your problem is. He said, what's that? I said, you're bitter. He looked at me and he says, well, maybe I am a little bit bitter. I said, what? For God's sake, man, that's like saying you're a little bit pregnant. Brother Colthorpe, you don't stay just a little bit pregnant. And you don't stay just a little bit bitter. Paul said that root of bitterness will spring up, trouble you, and many will be defiled. This is a generation that, if we're not careful, we, we become so self-absorbed. I do know this, that Galatians, Paul said, be not deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever man sow, that shall he also reap. He that soweth through the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth through the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. I know this, that there in a congregation this side, there are people here today that are, that are facing decisions that, that are going to be of consequence. And I'm warning you, you need to let the Word of God be the governor. You need to let the Word of God be the overseer of this decision. Because when you make this decision, only God in heaven knows how many other decisions you're making that you don't know that you're making. In Genesis 39, Joseph has, has uh, been betrayed by his brethren. He has been sold into bondage. He's had a vision. God's given him a dream, and he's so excited about it. And, and he just knows his brethren are going to be as excited as he is. And when he tells them his vision about their sheaves bowing down to his sheaf, and they're not nearly as, as ecstatic about, about his destiny as he is, and, and so they cast him into a pit, and they sell him to Arab merchants, and they take him down to Egypt, and there on the auction block he's, he's marketed like a piece of merchandise, and, and Potiphar takes him home, and, and through a long series of hurtful and and offensive situations and sacrifices and great prices that he's paid. He, he elevates himself to the, to the manager of all of Potiphar's house. And in verse 7 it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is within with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? This is a young man who's paid some extreme prices and gone through great hardship and sacrifice. Bishop, it would have been easy to develop the mindset, you know, I deserve just a little bit of pleasure. I deserve just a little bit of fun. But somewhere along the line, he had hidden some divine principles in his heart. And at that moment, that decisive moment in his life, he didn't make decisions based out of his carnal appetite or, or his emotions, Brother Pedigo. He, he let the Word of God be the overseer and the caretaker of his mind and his heart. And he refused and, and he ran away. And, but when he made that decision, he did not know that he was also deciding that she was going to lie on him. He did not know he was deciding he was going to be cast into prison. He did not know that there in prison he was going to meet a, an ungrateful butler of Pharaoh and be forgotten for two years. He didn't know he was deciding that after two years he was going to be called out to interpret Pharaoh's dream. He didn't know that because of that he was deciding he was going to become the governor of all Egypt. He didn't know because of that. He was deciding he was going to save that family that cast him aside like a piece of rubbish. He didn't know he was deciding to set the stage for Shiloh to come. He was making decisions. He didn't know he was making. He had simply hidden divine principles, made the word of God the overseer of his heart. Let me tell you something, folks. Life is full of pitfalls, offensive situations. Jesus said it cannot be but that offenses will come. The devil will orchestrate. They may come from the pew beside you. They may come from the pulpit. Before I get through here tonight, I may say something that's offensive to somebody in this building. But once you have been confronted with a defense, uh, an offensive situation, 
then you have to decide whether or not you choose to become offended. And if you choose, if you make a decision to become offended, you have no idea how many other decisions you may be making at that point in time. This is a perilous hour. I could call names that many of you young people would not recognize, but at one point were household names among us. They were voices that had great influence in our movement. They were voices that helped form and mold our movement. They were voices that gave us direction. They were voices that, that we honored and revered. And somewhere along the way, those voices got sidetracked. It might have been an arrogant spirit or a spirit of superiority or an offended spirit or a proud spirit. But somewhere they made decisions to alter their message and to alter their voice. And when they did that, they didn't know they were making other decisions. But they didn't realize they were making. They didn't know, some of them, that when they decided to forfeit a love for this truth, they were also deciding to receive a strong delusion and believe a lie and be damned. Let me tell you something. The tongue is a dangerous thing. James said the tongue can defile the whole body. If it can defile a whole body, it can defile a whole family. If it can defile a whole family, it can defile a whole church. We need to learn to guard our mouths. Gossip, gossip has no place in the apostolic church. And I know none of you gossip. Everything you say is true. Can I define gossip for you? Gossip is nothing more or less than simply the sharing of negative information with somebody that's not part of the problem and can't be part of the solution. So if you're not part of the problem, let me tell you something. He that answer a matter before he hears, it's a shame and a folly to him. If an organization is run right, I think ours is. If a church is run right, I think this one is. You can live your whole life in it, and, and you, can, you can hear about problems, and in your whole life, you'll be able to count on your fingers the times that you have all the facts. So let me let you know. Let me give you a blank. If you're not part of the problem and you're not in a position to be part of the solution, shut up. <laughs> Titus said, speak evil of no man. That's a decision. And it's a decision that's only possible if you've hidden the word of God, if you've made it the overseer, the caretaker of your heart. Psalm said, keep thy tongue from evil. That is a decision. That's an act of will. Proverbs said, he that keepeth his tongue keepeth his life. That is a decision. David comes into the camp of Israel. He is in an army camp. David is not a soldier. He is a shepherd. He already has the anointing on his life. He's going to be the king. But he's not the king yet because he's not ready to be the king yet. He has no expertise with weaponry. He does not understand warfare. He's never led an army. He's going to spend some time. You, let me tell you something. There's a big difference in the calling and the sending. God will call you, but that doesn't mean you're ready to go. Once you are called, then God's going to step back, and he's going to wait till you qualify yourself to be But he comes into the camp and, and, uh, and he hears the voice of the valley, send me a man. And he looks around, he's ecstatic. He's ready, he's, he's ready to see some champion rise up and go. And nobody goes. And I'll, I'll cut to the chase. David says, well, I'll go. You know, Brother Mooney, any young preacher that starts his ministry and preaches a dozen times and hasn't preached on David and Goliath, I'd like to meet him. And oh, that, that's, it makes great preaching. I'm telling you, but the problem is, I think most of the time we preach it wrong. We get up here and we say, bless God, if God's called you, you're going to go into this battle and eventually you're going to face your giant and you're going to have to kill your giant and you're going to have, you know, the problem with that is there's just a limited number in any generation of giants that need killing. And so as a result, there's a limited demand for giant killers. 
If the only way you could please God in David's generation was to be a giant killer, there wasn't a whole lot of people that had a chance of pleasing God. We say, well, David won the great victory. David didn't win a victory. David killed Goliath. The army of Israel won the victory. They came out of the trenches and did what they could have done all along if they just got their... What David did was change the atmosphere from fear to faith. And when the atmosphere was changed from fear to faith, the army of Israel came out of the trenches and won the battle. It's not required in a man that you be a giant killer. It's required that you be faithful. Great victories won, and they head back to the city. And, and you know how soldiers are up and up and up and up, and they start singing songs. And, and while they're marching back, somebody starts writing a song. And Saul has killed his thousands. And Saul's up there at the front of the troop. He says, Hey, I never heard that song before. That is one cool song. Yeah, he, he's composing his way. Well, is there any more? He said, yeah, in fact, he just finished the second verse. And David has killed his ten thousands. And a competitive spirit began to flirt with Saul. Now, when I was, when I was a superintendent of California, we had seminars every year for our license applicants and it was a lesson I always taught about doing ministry the right way for the right reason. And, and it boiled down to an understanding of eight things that I couldn't do. And one of those eight things that I couldn't do if I was going to do ministry the right way for the right reason, I could not care who got the credit. But a competitive spirit began to flirt with Saul. And Saul made a decision to entertain that competitive spirit. The sad thing is, when he made a decision to entertain that competitive spirit, he did not know he was also deciding that that spirit of competition was going to morph into a spirit of bitterness. He did not know when he decided to adopt the spirit of bitterness that he was deciding that all of his sons were going to die a horrible death. He did not know in deciding that that he was deciding that his daughter David's wife was going to be barren all the days of her life. He did not know he was deciding because of she inherited his animosity. He did not know he was deciding the kingdom was going to be ripped from his head. He did not know he was deciding his head was going to wind up on a Philistine stake. He was making decisions. He didn't know he was making. Today, God in heaven knows how many spirits of jealousy, strife, Conflict, bitterness that exist in the church today are products of decisions regarding seemingly little things that happened so long ago. David said, forgive lest Satan get the advantage. Forgiveness is a decision. Not to forgive is a decision. And they're usually more far-reaching than we realize at that moment in time. When you decide to carry a grudge, my brother, you may be making other decisions you don't know you're making. Paul said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, evil speaking be put away. That is a decision. Keep thine heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Hear me. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I can control my actions, but I cannot control the reaction to my action. Something I learned the hard way a long time ago, I am the master of my every unspoken word but I am the eternal servant of every word that should have remained unspoken. I stand here tonight. In my ministry, I've been preaching 54 years. I've been in some type of pastoral role for 50 of those years. 
There have been young people that sat under my preaching that heard me preach about separation, moral and sexual purity, and dedication and consecration. And some of those young people made decisions about their moral purity. And they thought they were just making a decision about a one-night stand. Some of them did not know they were deciding they were going to contract the AIDS virus. Some of them did not know they were deciding they were going to become teenage parents. Some of them did not know they were deciding they were going to drift into the drug culture. Some of them did not know they were actually deciding they were going to die in their teens. They were making decisions they didn't know they were making. I have had parents that sat in my congregation that decided to become offended at me. And Brother Mooney, I, I, I'm sorry to tell you there are times that perhaps from a carnal viewpoint their offense was sometimes justified because my performance as a pastor has not always been perfect. But they did not know when they decided to entertain that spirit of offense. They were deciding that they were going to become bitter about it. And they did not know when they were deciding to become bitter that they were deciding that they were going to vent their venom in front of their children. And they did not know in deciding to do that, they were deciding that their kids would grow up to despise the church and someday be so far out there. I don't know if anybody can reach them. This was driven home so pointedly to me some time back. We, uh, the choir was getting ready to sing and my youngest daughter was going to sing a lead in the choir. And she said, now I haven't asked anybody for permission, but I want, I want to testify tonight. She said, I, I want to publicly thank my mother and dad for something they don't realize they did. She said, not long ago, we had a, a big family gathering where a lot of the extended family that we seldom ever see was there. And said, I was sitting at a table with my dad and some of the other extended family, and somebody brought up a subject and said, my dad immediately changed his subject and moved off, and I could tell he was uncomfortable with it. And I said, wait, wait, wait what are you talking about? What you? And said, they began to detail to me something that happened when I was just an infant. Said, uh, another preacher had had appealed to my father to, to help him with something and he desperately needed my dad's help and he made a covenant with my dad and said, long story short, my dad did that. He stepped in and, he, and said, that preacher did not live up to his agreement. He said, it put my mother and dad in a very precarious financial situation that took them a number of years to dig their way out of. And she said, here's the thing. I never knew that. And she said, that preacher has been a tremendous blessing in my life. In fact, I'm not sure that I would be living for God today if it wasn't for that preacher. And she said, those were blessings I would have never been able to receive if I had known. These parents, they thought they were just allowing themselves the luxury of heart, hurt feelings for a season. But they did not know they were making decisions that they did not know they were making. I'm about done. I need some mood music. In my life, when I was just a little child, my father and our pastor had a great conflict. Now, Brother Mooney, I didn't know anything about it till I was grown and married. The only way I knew then, my granddad told me. But my father was deeply, deeply wounded. But as a young man, when my dad came to God at the age of 17, he, he developed such an incredible love affair with the Bible and the Word of God. And if there was ever a human being that hid the Word of God in their heart, it was my daddy. And in the midst of that deep hurt, he allowed the word of God to be the overseer 
and the caretaker of his heart. And my deeply wounded father, and, and the, the particulars aren't important, who was right, who was wrong. There was, there was never a sheet of paper sliced so thin it didn't have two sides to it. But Bishop, he submitted himself to spiritual authority. He took the low road. He humbled himself and submitted himself to a pastor who, right, wrong, or whatever, had deeply wounded him. He decided that was the right thing to do. What he did not know when he decided to submit himself to his spiritual authority, he did not know he was deciding that five years later, his little boy was going to get the Holy Ghost in that church. He didn't know that at the age of 18, his little boy was going to get his call to preach in that church. He didn't know that he was deciding on September the 5th 1965, Laquita Reed and her family was going to walk in that church. She was going to steal my heart and take me on the most incredible 52-year honeymoon a man could ever go on. He was making decisions he didn't know he was making. He didn't know that, that when he made that decision, he was deciding there would come a day that that little boy that was going to get the Holy Ghost and get his call to preach and marry them was going to become his pastor in that church. He didn't know that when he made that decision that as a result of my pastoring that church and the exposure that there would come a day I would be elected superintendent of the district and, and his own grandson would be elected pastor of that church. He didn't know he was going to have five grandchildren and five great-grandchildren come to God in that church. He was making decisions. He didn't know he was making. He didn't know he was deciding that of all the people that have ever attended Truth Tabernacle in Bakersfield, California, his name would hold the highest esteem. If you walk into our family center today, right above the front doors, the Alvin Mullins Family Center. Brother Mooney, as I stand on this pulpit today and rehearse my life, I cannot think of a single positive aspect of my life that is not attributable directly to that one decision that my dad made when he made a lifetime of decisions for his children and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren that he did not know he was making. David said in Psalms 139, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Let's stand together tonight. I have felt definite direction in this tonight. I have no idea what things that any of you here are wrestling with, what unique situations that you're facing, but I'm appealing to you. When you come to that decisive moment, be sure that you've let the word of God become the overseer and the caretaker of your heart. Because you will make that seemingly insignificant, inconsequential decision now. And have no idea the innumerable number of other decisions that you will be making for the rest of your life. You may be making decisions that you do not know that you're making. 